Inequality. It's nasty, it's mean, and it's getting obscene. But for the longest time, we haven't really had much of a sense of just how bad inequality is. You see, the rich, in their machinations to avoid paying higher rates of taxes, also do a pretty good job of hiding their information from economists. Therefore, the task of compiling the data alone is a formidable task. And perhaps the single most important achievement in doing all of this was published in 2013. It was known as Capital and the 21st Century, and it was published by French economist Thomas Piketty. Now, perhaps the single most important thing that set Piketty apart from a lot of his peers was that in working in collaboration, partly, particularly with the California-based economist Emmanuel Saez, he was able to get an incredible amount of tax data in order to do estimations going back more than two centuries. For the French, he was able to go back even further. In light of the sheer significance of the amount of work that Piketty put into his book, one would think that it would remain all the rage. After all, inequality remains one of the defining issues of contemporary times, and at first it seemed like this book was really going to go for the top. Paul Krugman in the New York Times wrote a glowing review of it, the Financial Times named it one of their top ten books of the year, and more broadly, the intelligentsia seemed ready to finally confront the staggering levels of inequality in our societies. But that wasn't ultimately meant to be. As it would turn out, 2013 would be the year in which capital in the 21st century burned bright and then burned out. In fact, it was commonly noted that Amazon, in surveying data from readers of Capital in the 21st Century on Kindle, found that many readers scarcely got past the 27th page. In essence, the fact that his book was a book, a tome, and not a manifesto, proved to be both its blessing in academic circles and its downfall amongst the popular press. But even that isn't quite true. Well, it's undeniably the case that P Piketty and his collaborators, most importantly the California-based economist Emmanuel Saez, put an incredible amount of work into their data, incidentally of which it's all available online. Even academia, as some have gone to note, has really shunned the book in terms of serious engagement with it, despite its dire predictions. This is, of course, where the internet kicks in. Today we're going to be talking about inequality, specifically through the lens of Piketty. I'm going to walk you through the major arguments that Piketty presents, and you're going to be disarmed by how simple they are. And yet, in light of the sheer amount of resources and empirical data that back it up, I really want to impress to you both how serious the issue of inequality is, and how demonstrably Piketty is able to confirm some of the troubling trends that define contemporary society. We'll be talking about all this and more on today's The Delta. <laughs> So like all good things, Piketty decides to work in threes. There are three laws that he asserts in his book that broadly prefigure a lot of the analysis that he does. I'm going to walk you through all of them. They're basically just equations and inequalities. And don't be put off by the mathiness. If you think long and hard about it, and I'll do my best to get you there, you'll find that you're able to get a pretty straightforward toolkit for analyzing inequality. Better yet, once you understand what the nature of the fundamental laws are, a lot of the data speaks for itself. So let's move on to the first law. This law is one that stipulates that alpha equals beta times r. What does that even mean? Well, stripped of jargon, it means this. Alpha, which for Piketty equals the pure rate of return on capital, must be equal to beta which is equal to the capital income ratio, multiplied by R, the pure rate of return on capital. Still not following with me? Let's break it down one level further. Beta is actually explained by the second law. Beta is equal to the amount of capital, which is all of the productive assets that exist in society, divided by the income, or Y, or you can think of it more broadly as like the GDP of society. So, in other words, we're measuring the stock of total wealth that exists in society as a ratio over the total amount of income that exists in society. That ratio is equal to beta. Now, beta, Piketty analyzes, typically tends to fall in the range of being between 4 and 7. Don't worry, we're going to get there. So knowing that beta tends to equal between 4 and 7, what Piketty is saying in a roundabout accounting type way is that the amount of wealth that exists collectively in society tends to be worth between 4 and 7 years worth of the annual income that everybody in society draws in. Okay, so now that we have beta, we need to plug it back into our first law, 
you recall that the first law states that alpha, or capital share of income, is equal to beta, remember, the capital income ratio, multiplied by R, which is equal to the pure rate of return on capital, which tends to wobble between 4 and 6%. Now remember, that's the pure rate of return on capital, meaning after you strip out things like inflation and other things that tend to reduce the return on assets. So what Piketty is saying is not just a statement of a law, but in a way, a kind of accounting identity. He's saying the amount of wealth that those in society pull home from owning capital is equal to the ratio of the amount of capital relative to the size of the economy multiplied by how much, on average, they can pull from it. So what you're seeing here is that he's drawing a relationship between the store of previously accumulated wealth and the amount that those who own that wealth pull from the wider society. Typically, this amount has been believed to be relatively stable. In fact, one famous British economist known as Nicholas Caldor named the stability of alpha, of the capital income ratio, as being one of his fundamental Caldor facts, stipulating that it was an empirical regularity that roughly 40% of all of the wealth in society is going to be earned by those who own the means of production, housing, capital, and the like. For those that think that our contemporary society is a paragon of individualism, where by muscle alone you're able to make your way in the world and own what you keep, the fact that about four in every ten dollars is uncontroversially believed to be owed to those who already own wealth and assets should probably be thinking a little deeper about the assumptions of their belief. But in any case, we're moving on. Alpha equals beta times R. That's the relationship that we have. We now need to ask what influences the capital income ratio, that beta that we've been talking about. Beta, Piketty says in his second law, is influenced by the savings rate, divided by the growth rate. Now, in an intuitive way, this makes a lot of sense. Just as we've said that it's the capital rate over income, so too does it make sense that the amount of capital, the amount of collective wealth that we store, should be directly related to the savings rate, and conversely, that the income level in society should be proportional to the growth in the economy as a whole. So hopefully I've been able to get you through the first two laws in a pretty straightforward way. Now, I promise this is going to get less boring and academic in a moment, but it's really important that you understand those fundamental bits because they're foundational to what comes after, and it's so important that Piketty spends quite literally about 400 of those pages discussing and analyzing the nature of these equations and relationships. No wonder no one got past page 27. Now, what Piketty says is that beta has a tendency to rise over time. And the reason for this is stipulated in his third law, which states R is greater than G. Don't worry, we'll unpack. R, remember from the first equation, is the pure rate of return on capital. That's the amount on average after inflation and the like that those who own wealth are able to pull on their assets. And G, if you'll remember from our second equation, is the average rate of growth in the economy. In a broader sense, what Piketty is saying is, on average, the amount, the rate at which people earn income from owning things tends to consistently grow faster than the rate at which the economy overall grows, and therefore the rate at which wages for most people tends to rise. As a result of this fact, Beta, which from the first equation tends to plug directly into capital share of income, has a tendency to rise over time. Importantly for him, and in contradistinction to people like Nicholas Caldor, what Piketty notices is that the fact that Beta rises over time, rather than remaining flat, is important because it's only been punctuated by two events in the last century. Unhelpfully for us, those were World War I and... World War II. Hardly a good precedent. Again, what Piketty is arguing is that the tendency of capital to accumulate itself consistently outstrips the growth of the economy as a whole, and as a result, the concentration of wealth and income into fewer hands tends to be self-reinforcing. In the 20th century, this was unquestionably true, punctuated only again by confiscatory rates of taxation, hyperinflation, and literally total war within and between societies. That's the dire prediction that we're dealing with. What Piketty shows further is that not only was Beta rising 
and al therefore alpha rising and the general rate of inequality rising, but that after it was punctuated by the two world wars, it kept right on rising to the present. Perhaps one of the most distressing and contemporary findings that Piketty notes is that today, in countries like the United States, France, the UK, really globally, inequality is almost universally on the rise, and in many countries like the United States and France, is higher than it was in the Roaring Twenties in the case of the US, and in the Belle Epique, which is a period notorious for inequality in France around the turn of the 19th century. Now, what does this mean for us today? Now, at this point, I want to add a little bit of a caveat, because I know a lot of people are saying, okay, sure, maybe inequality is rising here and there, and maybe there are some super rich, but laws of supply and demand, market competition, surely all of these things are whittling down levels of inequality, right? No. In Piketty's own words, the fact that capital yields income, which in accordance with the original meaning of the word we refer back to as the annual rent produced by capital, has absolutely nothing to do with imperfect with the problem of imperfect competition or monopoly. If capital plays a useful role in the process of production, it is natural that it should be paid. When growth is slow, it is almost inevitable that this return on capital is significantly higher than the growth rate, which automatically bestows outsized importance on inequalities of wealth accumulated in the past. This logical contradiction cannot be resolved by a dose of additional competition. Rent is not an imperfection in the market. It is rather the consequence of a pure and perfect market for capital, as economists understand it. Straight from the book. In short, this isn't something that we can simply legislate away. It is a fundamental defect of the system, and it demands robust action to be fixed. So we've been dealt a pretty dire hand. What Piketty has told us through his three laws is that there is an inexorable tendency towards inequality in capitalistic market societies. These tendencies are not structural flaws, they exist by design, and they demand incredibly robust, or if history is any guide, completely catastrophic action in order to be solved, arrested, or reversed. What are we going to make of this? How does this flavor our contemporary politics? To me, Piketty is important today as in 2013, and indeed since he began collecting research, not because of it's a merely academic question, but because this prefigures much of our politics today. The takeaway should be very clear. In an era of record inequality, which I've discussed in previous videos, anyone who isn't seriously able to discuss these issues is not really seriously engaged in politics. People who want to promote incremental reforms on the side are all well and good if they're well-meaning, but often the reality is they're not well-meaning, and they're simply trying to evade fundamental questions. When people today, for example, advocate for a $15 minimum wage, as the fight for 15 has most famously done, they're seen as economic radicals who are advocating for a form of economics that is simply untenable or against business savvy. But this couldn't be further from the truth. Apart from the fact that had the minimum wage merely tracked with inflation in productivity, many surveys find that the minimum wage would be today, if tracked from levels in roughly the 1960s, be about, if not more than $20. There's a real foundational question that we need to ask about our form of economics and politics today. Are we seriously committed to having a more fair, egalitarian society in which all members are able to equally participate? Or are we simply interested in perpetuating the inequalities of the past as far into the future as we can? It's no surprise to most that they don't feel like politics engages them, but by nature of how our economy is run, we really couldn't expect any other outcome. If we're serious about living in a democracy, and not merely some form of plutocracy, then fundamental reforms in the way that income is distributed and the way that capital is allocated is an essential first point. Initiatives recently proposed by Senator Bernie Sanders are a good example of how we can help fix this. By delinking the divide between capital and labor, we can help more equitably distribute the inefficiencies and inequalities that tend to be produced by market societies. But ultimately, it is a product of rational deliberation and conscious choice that will take us there, and it will require some strident measures. To those that simply think that this is a far-left dogma, apart from the fact that, empirically, if one looks at polling, it's the opposite of the case, I can turn to even the words of the most famous moderate classical liberals for my point. The laws and conditions of the production of wealth partake of the character of physical truths. There is nothing optional or arbitrary about them. It is not so with the distribution of wealth. That is a matter of human institution solely. The things once were, mankind, individually or collectively, 
can do with them as they like. The lesson from Piketty is clear. Today, as in the past, inequality rules. But will it rule the future? Hey guys, thanks so much for watching the video. Uh, it's really cool to be able to do these and I love just being able to share some of my nerdy thoughts with the world. Um, I've been posting on Reddit around and I've gotten some really nice replies. People have given some feedback. We're doing our best to integrate those. Uh, if you have any ideas, any constructive comments or criticisms, always happy to hear them. And if you have any videos, or topics that you'd like us to cover, of course, always happy to do those as well. Thanks again for watching and as always, don't forget to like and subscribe.